On the 16th of February, 1860, the USS Merrimack moored at the Norfolk Navy Yard and was decommissioned and placed in reserve. By that point, the Merrimack was roughly four years old, having been designed in haste as a result of the Crimean War that started in 1853. The vessel was to show the world the potential of United States naval power, and at the time, it was most certainly one of the most powerful warships in the United States fleet. However, it did have a series of significant drawbacks that would carry over to hinder it during its reconversion into an ironclad during the American Civil War. Namely, its unstable center of gravity combined with its sharp deep bottom created a platform that rolled even in moderate swells, and, most damning, the ship's machinery was highly unreliable, meaning that the sails were its primary set of propulsion, while the machinery was purely auxiliary. The primary reason for the vessel being decommissioned in February of 1860 was to give the Navy time to work on its machinery, which, by March of 1861, the machinery, particularly the boilers, were still partially disassembled. With political tensions between the northern and southern states at an all-time high, on the 10th of April, 1861, Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells sent a message to Commodore Macaulay of the Norfolk Navy Yard, a segment of its states. It is, therefore, deemed important that the steamer Merrimack should be in condition to proceed to Philadelphia or to any other yard, should it be deemed necessary, or, in case of danger from unlawful attempts to take possession of her, that she should be placed beyond their reach. As a result, the Navy sent Engineer-in-Chief Mr. Isherwood to the Norfolk Navy Yard to inspect the Merrimack's engines, which he did on the 14th of April, 1861, and he described the machinery as being in a wretched state. The braces were disconnected from the boilers, and the primary propulsion engines were in a disabled condition. It was estimated that the Merrimack's machinery would not be capable of propelling the ship out of the Norfolk Navy Yard for at least another month. A couple of days later, on the 17th of April, one of the two boilers was lit for the first time in nearly a year. It appeared that there was hope that Merrimack could safely be transferred to a yard up north, but that very night, Virginia decided to secede from the Union, and the Norfolk Navy Yard was placed under immediate threat. As a result, a series of ships were scuttled between Cranny Island and Sewell's Point, blocking the entrance and exit of any large ships, including the Merrimack. Three days later, on the 20th of April, Virginia secessionists began moving towards the Norfolk Navy Yard in order to capture it from the United States government, and men working there who were still loyal to the United States had foreseen this move and had prepared the yard for destruction. Explosions and flames began to erupt from the buildings and ships as the fleeing men were determined to destroy the functionality and service of the yard. In the case of the Merrimack, it was set on fire, but, simultaneously, its sea cocks were open, which allowed its lower hull to flood. While the lower hull flooded, the top of the ship burned down, and, by the time the flames had reached the waterline, they had burned out, leaving the lower hull of the ship intact. Over the course of the next week, the Confederates would examine the remains of the U.S. Navy at the Norfolk Navy Yard, and the USS United States was the only vessel that remained afloat. The Pennsylvania, Columbia, and Dolphin were all burned down to their floor heads or the bottom of the hull. The Raritan had been burned and sunk. The Merrimack had been burned to its copper line and sunk. The Germantown had been burned to its bulwark on the port side and sunk. And Plymouth, Delaware, and Columbus were all badly burned and sunk. Out of all of the vessels, only three had potential futures. The United States and Germantown could be repaired relatively quickly and cheaply, while the Merrimack could be raised and completely reconstructed, though it would be extensive and rather expensive. Luckily for the Confederacy, when the United States abandoned the Norfolk Navy Yard, they failed to completely destroy it and all of its assets. More than 1,000 operational cannons were captured, a nearly endless supply of timber for ship construction was captured, primarily pine and oak, and they had captured a series of facilities largely undamaged. This included the number one dry dock at the Gosport Navy Yard, which was large enough to support the lower hull of the sunken Merrimack. 
As for the Merrimack in specific, a series of proposals were set forth as to what could be done with the sunken wreck. One of the suggestions was rebuilding it back into a steam frigate. It was decided that works of that magnitude would exceed the value of the ship, and given the stability problems the Merrimack had during its service life, going back into the steam frigate form didn't make sense. This is when two important men in the story of the CSS Virginia step into the field. Naval Constructor Porter and Lieutenant Brook. These two men were simultaneously working on a similar idea regarding the reconversion of the Merrimack into a casemate ironclad that solely relied on its steam engines for propulsion. Now, against common belief, this was not the first time in the States this idea was proposed, and the completed Virginia would not be the first casemate ironclad in service within the States, as the United States Navy had simultaneously proposed casemate ironclads and had seven in service before the Virginia was completed. It is worth pointing out, however, due to the early stages of the war and design process of both the city-class ironclads and the Virginia's conversion, neither side really had a clear idea of what the other was doing. Going back to the conversion, it was proposed that a iron casemate be erected over top of the machinery spaces of the Merrimack's hull. This would protect the machinery, and within this casemate, a series of portholes would be cut in to where cannon could stick out and fire. As for the Merrimack's wooden lower hull, this would have to be completely submerged before the proposed ironclad could ever go into combat. The Secretary of the Confederate Navy, Stephen Mallory, asked that the idea be developed further and more detailed designs presented. In the meantime, he looked around into the logistics behind supplying such a conversion, and he also began looking into companies for salvaging the hull of the Merrimack. He found a private company, Messrs. B&J, Baker & Company, had the appropriate supplies for the recovery of the Merrimack, and they were local to the wreck. So, on the 18th of May, 1861, he finalized a contract with them for the recovery of the Merrimack's hull. The process of recovering the Merrimack was a rapid affair. Throughout the remainder of May and into early June, a series of buoyancy tanks were secured to the sides of the Merrimack's hull. Initially, these tanks were filled with water. Once in place, a series of tubes would be connected to the tanks that ran to a surface vessel with a steam engine on board. This steam engine would force air down into the tanks, which would push the water out of the tanks, steadily raising the Merrimack's hull. The small tug Rene would then tow the Merrimack's hull to the Gosport Navy Yard, where it would be placed in dry dock, and there the water would be pumped out of the ship's hull. Once the hull was pumped out, a full assessment of the damage to the hull and machinery could be compiled, and this meant that the designs for the conversion into an ironclad could be completed and submitted. By the end of June, the Merrimack was safely sitting in dry dock, and the assessments and designs were completed, and this meant that on the 11th of July, 1861, Stephen Mallory sent these orders to Flag Officer Forrest, whom was now in charge of the Norfolk Navy Yard. Sir, you will proceed with all practicable dispatch to make the changes in the Merrimack, and build, equip, and fit her in all respects according to her designs and plans of the constructor and engineer Mersers, Porter, and Williamson. As time is of the first importance in the matter, you will see that the work progresses without delay to completion. With that message, construction on what would become the CSS Virginia was finally authorized to begin. With that having been said, that concludes part one into the construction of the CSS Virginia. So, if you have learned something new in this video, why not leave a like and a comment down below, and have a wonderful day.